Do you know how walking on two legs shaped the course of human evolution? In today's video, we're diving deep into the fascinating story of bipedalism, how our early ancestors stood up and set humanity on a path toward becoming the species we are today. Part 1, The Precursor to Bipedalism, The Arboreal Ancestors To understand how bipedalism evolved in early hominins, we must first examine the lifestyle of our tree-dwelling primate ancestors. For millions of years, primates thrived in the dense, tropical forests of Africa, moving with agility through the treetops. These ancestors, much like modern-day apes, were adapted for an arboreal life, relying on quadrupedal locomotion, swinging between branches using their arms, and grasping with their feet. This lifestyle was perfectly suited for survival in environments where food sources, shelter, and escape routes from predators were primarily located above the ground. Primates that lived during this period, around 10 to 7 million years ago, exhibited a number of traits that were advantageous for climbing. Their long, powerful arms, mobile shoulder joints, and opposable thumbs allowed them to navigate the trees with remarkable dexterity. Their feet, with a grasping big toe, functioned much like a second pair of hands, assisting in their arboreal navigation. The spinal column and pelvis were structured in such a way that supported movement on all fours, keeping the center of gravity low and balanced as they clambered through the trees. However, these forests did not remain stable. Over time, tectonic shifts and climate fluctuations began to change the environment. The African continent experienced cycles of cooling and drying, which gradually fragmented the lush forests, leading to the emergence of savannas and woodland areas. As forest cover receded, the distances between tree patches increased, forcing our ancestors to adapt to a more varied environment that included both wooded and open landscapes. The pressure to survive in these new, mixed environments created a scenario where a different form of locomotion would become increasingly valuable. While climbing was still essential in areas where trees were present, crossing the ground efficiently was becoming just as crucial. Walking on two legs, or bipedalism, likely began as a practical way for early hominins to move between trees without the energy expense of quadrupedalism, which was less efficient on flat ground. Additionally, standing upright provided a better vantage point for spotting predators or locating distant food sources. One of the earliest signs that this shift was beginning comes from changes observed in fossil skulls. The position of the foramen magnum, the hole through which the spinal cord passes, began to move from the back of the skull to a more central position, indicating that the head was now being held upright. This repositioning allowed early hominins to balance their heads atop their spines, a key requirement for walking on two legs. While these early changes were modest, they represented the start of a gradual but profound transformation. During this period, it's important to remember that bipedalism was not yet the dominant mode of movement. Early hominins would have alternated between climbing and walking, utilizing both forms of locomotion depending on the circumstances. These adaptations suggest a degree of versatility that was critical for survival in an ever-changing landscape. The groundwork for bipedalism was being laid, but it would take millions of years and many more environmental pressures for these early hominins to commit fully to walking upright as their primary mode of movement. Part 2, Climate Change and Habitat Shift, The Push Towards Bipedalism The shift towards bipedalism cannot be fully understood without exploring the role of environmental changes that forced hominins to adapt. Between 6 and 5 million years ago, the Earth's climate began to cool, and Africa's tropical forests continued to shrink. These climate shifts were driven by a combination of factors, including changes in the Earth's orbit and tilt, which altered rainfall patterns, and tectonic activity, such as the uplift of the East African Rift Valley, which created significant geographical barriers. These changes led to the gradual transformation of Africa's landscape. Large portions of once continuous forests were now punctuated by open grasslands and savannas, dotted with scattered trees and shrubs. The hominins that lived during this period, such as Sahelanthropus cadensis and Aurorin tuginensis, had to navigate this more open terrain, which presented a new set of survival challenges. 
For the first time, hominins had to regularly cross large expanses of ground between food and water sources, as well as safe refuges from predators. One hypothesis for the adoption of bipedalism is known as the savanna hypothesis, which suggests that standing and walking on two legs provided early hominins with several advantages in the open environments of the savanna. From an evolutionary standpoint, bipedalism likely offered a better vantage point for spotting potential dangers, such as predators lurking in the tall grass. The ability to scan the horizon for threats or food resources would have given bipedal hominins a distinct survival advantage over quadrupedal species. Another important factor in the shift towards bipedalism is thermoregulation. Walking on two legs exposed less of the body's surface area to direct sunlight, reducing the risk of overheating in the hot savanna environment. At the same time, standing upright allowed for better air circulation around the body, further aiding in heat dissipation. Quadrupedalism, by contrast, exposed more of the body to the intense African sun, which may have been a liability for hominins as they began to spend more time in open areas. Energy efficiency also played a role. Studies have shown that bipedalism is more energetically efficient than quadrupedalism when it comes to covering long distances on flat terrain. This efficiency would have been especially important as food sources became more dispersed in the changing environment. Early hominins needed to be able to travel greater distances to forage for food and water, and bipedalism allowed them to do so without expending excessive amounts of energy. The fossil record provides important clues to these changes. Sahelanthropist cadensis, which lived around 7 million years ago, exhibits a mix of primitive and derived traits. Its skull suggests it was capable of holding its head upright, a sign of potential bipedalism, though its other skeletal features were still well suited for climbing. This mix of traits suggests that bipedalism was emerging as a useful adaptation for life in more open habitats, but that early hominins were still reliant on the trees for much of their daily activities. Auroran tugenensis, which lived around 6 million years ago, provides even stronger evidence of bipedalism. Its femur shows clear adaptations for upright walking, with a structure that could support the body's weight while standing or walking on two legs. At the same time, its arms and hands retained climbing adaptations, further reinforcing the idea that early bipedalism was part of a flexible locomotion strategy, rather than a complete commitment to life on the ground. As the climate continued to fluctuate, these early hominins found themselves increasingly relying on their ability to move efficiently across the ground. The gradual reduction of forested areas, combined with the need to find new food sources, avoid predators, and navigate larger home ranges, pushed hominins to develop more advanced forms of bipedalism. However, the anatomical changes required to walk upright efficiently were still in their early stages, and it would take several more million years for these adaptations to fully take hold. Part 3, The Anatomical Foundation, Early Skeletal Adaptations The evolution of bipedalism required a host of anatomical changes, particularly in the skeleton, as the transition from a primarily quadrupedal lifestyle to walking upright on two legs placed new demands on the body. One of the earliest hominins to show significant adaptations for bipedalism was Artipithecus ramidus, which lived around 4.4 million years ago. Fossil evidence from Artipithecus provides a detailed look at how the body began to change in response to the demands of walking on two legs. The most important adaptations for bipedalism occurred in the pelvis and lower limbs. In quadrupedal primates, the pelvis is elongated and narrow, which helps support the horizontal posture and distributes the weight of the body evenly across all four limbs. However, bipedalism required a shorter and wider pelvis that could better support the weight of the upper body and stabilize the trunk during walking. The pelvis of Artipithecus shows the beginnings of this transformation, with a shape that is more similar to modern humans than to quadrupedal apes. Additionally, the structure of the leg bones began to change. The femur, or thigh bone, in Artipithecus exhibits a slight angle towards the midline of the body, a feature known as the bicondylar angle. This angle is crucial for bipedalism because it allows the knees to be positioned directly under the center of gravity, improving balance and stability while walking. 
Without this adaptation, early hominins would have been less efficient at walking upright, as their legs would have splayed out to the sides, making balance difficult. While Ardipithecus displayed clear adaptations for bipedalism, it was not yet fully committed to walking on two legs. Its feet retained a grasping big toe, which would have been useful for climbing trees. This feature suggests that Ardipithecus lived in a mixed environment where both climbing and walking were important for survival. The foot structure allowed these early hominins to move adeptly in the trees while still being capable of walking upright on the ground when necessary. As hominins continued to evolve, these early adaptations became more pronounced, leading to the development of more efficient bipedalism. Part 4 Early Hominin Experimentation The Australopithecines as we continue the journey through the evolution of bipedalism, we encounter the Australopithecus genus, which marks a significant evolutionary phase in hominin development. These early hominins, which lived between 4 to 2 million years ago, show a more advanced adaptation to bipedalism compared to their predecessors, yet they retain some features that suggest a mixed lifestyle of climbing and walking. Fossil Evidence particularly from the famous specimen known as Lucy Australopithecus afarensis, provides critical insights into this transitionary phase in bipedal evolution. Australopithecus afarensis, which lived around 3.9 to 2.9 million years ago, is one of the most well-known and studied hominin species. Lucy's skeleton, discovered in Ethiopia in 1974, provided researchers with an unprecedented look at the anatomical adaptations that early hominins were developing to facilitate bipedalism. Lucy was small, about 3.5 feet tall, yet her skeleton revealed a combination of both primitive and advanced traits that highlighted the evolutionary experimentation with bipedalism. One of the most striking features of Australopithecus afarensis was its pelvis. Similar to Ardipithecus, but more advanced, the pelvis of A. Afarensis was short and broad, supporting an upright posture and improving balance during walking. The femur, or thigh bone, also showed significant adaptations, with a pronounced bicondylar angle that positioned the knees closer to the center of the body. This alignment is critical for bipedalism, as it allows for better balance and reduces the side-to-side -side sway that would occur with a less optimized structure. The legs of Australopithecus afarensis were longer relative to the arms compared to earlier hominins, which is another hallmark of more efficient bipedalism. Longer legs enable longer strides, which is a crucial factor in walking over long distances. However, a. Afarensis retained several traits that suggest it had not entirely abandoned life in the trees. Its arms were still relatively long, and its fingers were curved, features that are typically associated with climbing. These mixed traits indicate that while A. Afarensis was capable of efficient bipedalism, it likely spent a significant amount of time climbing trees for foraging or escaping predators. One of the most compelling pieces of evidence for bipedalism in A. Afarensis comes from the Litoli footprints. These fossilized footprints, discovered in Tanzania and dated to around 3.6 million years ago, are an astonishing record of early hominin locomotion. The footprints were left in volcanic ash and clearly show that the individuals who made them were walking upright on two legs, with a heel-to-toe stride that is remarkably similar to modern humans. The footprints reveal that a. Afarensis had developed a fully bipedal gait, though it is possible that their stride was slightly less efficient than ours, with a bit more swaying due to less developed pelvic stabilization. The dual nature of Australopithecus afarensis's lifestyle, combining both climbing and walking, suggests that bipedalism evolved gradually, with early hominins experimenting with different ways of moving through their environment. This flexibility may have been crucial for survival during this period, as the environment continued to shift between forested and open areas. By retaining their climbing abilities, early hominins could still exploit resources in the trees, while their bipedalism allowed them to move more efficiently across the ground when necessary. Another important factor to consider during this period is the role of hands in early hominins. Bipedalism freed the hands for a variety of uses, including carrying objects, using tools, and foraging. 
The ability to walk upright while holding food or tools may have provided significant evolutionary advantages. For example, it would have allowed early hominins to transport food over longer distances, share resources with others, or defend themselves with tools. Although Australopithecus is not known for advanced tool use, the freeing of the hands for other activities was a major shift in hominin evolution, and it laid the foundation for more complex behaviors seen in later hominin species. In terms of social structure, bipedalism may have also contributed to changes in how early hominins interacted with one another. The ability to carry food back to a central location could have promoted more communal living and sharing, which may have strengthened social bonds within groups. Additionally, standing upright could have facilitated more face-to-face -face interaction, which might have been important for the development of early forms of communication. While these are speculative hypotheses, it's clear that bipedalism had far-reaching effects beyond locomotion, influencing early hominin behavior and social dynamics. By the time of Australopithecus afarensis, bipedalism was firmly established as a primary mode of locomotion, though it had not yet reached the efficiency seen in later hominins. The mix of traits found in these early hominins reflects the transitional nature of this period, as natural selection continued to shape the anatomy and behavior of hominins to better suit a changing environment. The evolution of bipedalism was not a sudden shift but rather a long, gradual process that involved numerous adaptations over millions of years. Part 5 – Evolution of the Foot – The Stabilizing Platform The evolution of the hominin foot is one of the most crucial developments in the history of bipedalism. Early hominins, such as Australopithecus afarensis, still had feet that were somewhat adapted for climbing, but by the time of later hominins, such as Homo erectus, the foot had undergone significant changes that made walking and running on two legs much more efficient. The modern human foot is a highly specialized structure, designed to support the body's entire weight, absorb shock, and provide the leverage needed for efficient locomotion. One of the most important changes in the evolution of the foot was the loss of the grasping big toe. In early hominins, the big toe was opposable, much like the thumb, which allowed them to grasp branches while climbing. However, as hominins became more committed to bipedalism, the big toe shifted to align with the other toes, forming a more rigid structure. This alignment is critical for bipedalism, as it allows the foot to push off the ground during walking, providing forward propulsion. The development of arches in the foot was another major advancement. Modern humans have two primary arches, the longitudinal arch and the transverse arch, which act as shock absorbers and help distribute the weight of the body during walking and running. These arches also store elastic energy, which makes walking more energy efficient. Fossil evidence suggests that early hominins like Australopithecus afarensis had some degree of arch development, but it was not as pronounced as in modern humans. By the time of Homo erectus, however, the foot had fully developed the arches needed for efficient bipedalism. The Litoli footprints provide valuable insights into the evolution of the hominin foot. The footprints show that the individuals who made them had feet that were very similar to modern humans, with a pronounced heel strike and toe-off phase during walking. This suggests that by 3.6 million years ago, hominins had already developed a relatively modern walking gait, with a stable, propulsive foot. However, it is likely that these early hominins were not yet capable of running long distances as efficiently as modern humans. The evolution of the foot was not only important for walking but also for running. Later hominins, such as Homo erectus, are believed to have been capable of endurance running, which may have been important for hunting and scavenging. The structure of the foot, with its arches and aligned toes, allowed for better shock absorption and energy efficiency, which are crucial for long-distance running. Some researchers have even suggested that the ability to run long distances was a key factor in the success of Homo erectus and later hominins, as it would have allowed them to outlast prey animals during hunts or cover large distances in search of food. In addition to these changes, the ankle joint also underwent significant modifications. In quadrupedal primates, the ankle is highly flexible, which allows for a wide range of motion needed for climbing. However, in bipedal hominins, the ankle joint became more stable, 
with a limited range of motion that is better suited for walking and running. This stability is important for maintaining balance during bipedal locomotion, as it prevents excessive movement that could lead to injury. The evolution of the hominin foot reflects the broader transition from a mixed arboreal and terrestrial lifestyle to one that was predominantly ground-based. The changes in the foot, from a grasping structure to a rigid platform designed for walking and running, were critical for the success of bipedalism. These adaptations allowed hominins to move more efficiently across the landscape, which in turn opened up new opportunities for foraging, hunting, and migration. While the evolution of the foot may seem like a small change in the grand scheme of human evolution, it was a critical step in the development of bipedalism. Without the specialized structure of the modern human foot, hominins would not have been able to walk or run as efficiently, which would have limited their ability to survive and thrive in the challenging environments they faced. Part 6, The Rise of the Genus Homo, Enhanced Bipedalism and Brain Expansion With the rise of the genus Homo around 2.5 million years ago, bipedalism became more refined and efficient. Early species like Homo habilis and Homo erectus exhibited further advancements in their skeletal structure, particularly in their legs, pelvis, and feet, which allowed for more sustained walking and running. This period also marks the beginning of significant brain expansion, which is closely linked to the evolution of bipedalism. The transition from Australopithecus to Homo involved several key changes in body proportions. One of the most important developments was the lengthening of the legs relative to the arms, a trait that is critical for efficient bipedal locomotion. In earlier hominins like Australopithecus afarensis, the arms were still relatively long, indicating that they retained some climbing abilities. However, in Homo erectus, the legs became much longer, while the arms shortened, reflecting a shift toward a more terrestrial lifestyle. The pelvis of Homo erectus also shows important changes that improved bipedalism. The iliac blades of the pelvis are shorter and wider than those of earlier hominins, which allows for better stabilization of the trunk during walking and running. This pelvic structure is crucial for maintaining balance, especially during long-distance locomotion, as it minimizes side-to-side -side movement and conserves energy. The evolution of longer legs and a more efficient pelvis allowed Homo erectus to become a highly mobile species. Fossil evidence suggests that Homo erectus was capable of walking and running long distances, which would have been important for hunting, scavenging, and migration. The ability to cover large distances efficiently likely played a role in the successful expansion of Homo erectus out of Africa and into other parts of the world, such as Asia and Europe. Brain expansion is another important factor to consider in the evolution of Homo. Early species like Homo habilis had relatively small brains, but by the time of Homo erectus, brain size had increased significantly. The relationship between bipedalism and brain expansion is complex, but one hypothesis is that the energy savings provided by efficient bipedalism allowed more resources to be allocated to brain growth. Part 7, Bipedalism and its Impact on Social Structures The evolution of bipedalism in hominins did more than just transform how early humans moved. It also had profound implications for social behavior, tool use, cooperation, and the development of early culture. Standing upright and walking on two legs freed the hands for carrying food, using tools, and nurturing offspring. These changes laid the groundwork for the complex social structures that would eventually define human societies. One of the key impacts of bipedalism was its role in reshaping early hominin social dynamics. By freeing the hands, bipedalism allowed hominins to engage in more cooperative behaviors. Carrying food back to a central location, for instance, likely encouraged group sharing and reciprocity, behaviors that are foundational to social cohesion. This simple act of carrying, made possible by upright walking, may have led to a shift in group dynamics, fostering more complex forms of social interaction and cooperation. Early hominins such as Australopithecus and later Homo habilis were already showing signs of tool use, which is another behavior facilitated by bipedalism. 
While other primates, such as chimpanzees, use tools in a limited capacity, the evolution of bipedalism allowed hominins to use tools with far greater frequency and complexity. The use of hands to manipulate objects, whether for foraging, hunting, or defending against predators, became a central aspect of early human life. The Olduin tool culture, which emerged around 2.6 million years ago and is associated with early species such as Homo habilis, is an excellent example of how bipedalism and tool use went hand in hand. Olduin tools, simple but effective, allowed early hominins to process meat and other food sources, which may have contributed to changes in diet that fueled brain expansion. These stone tools were not overly sophisticated, but their development would not have been possible without the increased dexterity and freedom of movement provided by walking on two legs. In addition to freeing the hands for tool use, bipedalism also likely played a role in early parental care. With both hands available, early hominins could carry infants and protect them more easily. This would have had profound effects on social structures, as it allowed for more active parental involvement and potentially extended the period of infant dependency. A longer period of dependency would require more care and attention from parents, which may have led to stronger social bonds within groups and even early forms of cooperative child-rearing. These changes in social structures also likely had evolutionary consequences for communication. As hominins became more dependent on cooperative behaviors, whether for sharing food, raising children, or working together in small hunting or foraging groups, there would have been increased selective pressure for better communication skills. Standing upright may have facilitated face-to-face -face interactions, allowing for more nuanced social exchanges and early forms of vocalization or gestural communication. While the full evolution of language came much later, the social changes brought about by bipedalism may have set the stage for the development of more complex forms of communication. Bipedalism may have also impacted the organization of early hominin societies in terms of group size and structure. As hominins became more mobile and efficient at moving across the landscape, they would have had the ability to explore larger territories. This greater mobility could have influenced social dynamics, as groups spread out over larger areas, possibly leading to the formation of broader social networks. The ability to cover more ground also would have been important for early foraging strategies, allowing hominins to exploit a wider variety of food resources. Moreover, the increased efficiency of bipedal locomotion may have led to changes in gender roles and division of labor. Some researchers have speculated that the ability to carry food, tools, and infants might have led to different roles within early hominin groups. Females, who were more likely to be involved in child-rearing, might have focused on gathering and foraging, while males could have taken on roles related to hunting and group defense. However, this hypothesis remains controversial, as it is difficult to infer specific social roles from fossil evidence alone. Another social consequence of bipedalism relates to the development of early shelters and home bases. As hominins became more efficient at walking, they may have started to rely on specific locations where they could gather as a group, store food, and protect themselves from predators. These early, home bases, would have been crucial for social interactions, including the sharing of resources, group bonding, and possibly the early formation of social hierarchies. Bipedalism, by increasing mobility and freeing the hands, allowed hominins to construct simple shelters, transport materials, and return to central locations, a behavior that would have influenced the social organization of groups. Furthermore, the evolution of bipedalism likely influenced early hominin foraging strategies. While quadrupedal primates are largely restricted to foraging in trees or on the forest floor, bipedal hominins could exploit a wider variety of food sources. Standing upright would have allowed early hominins to forage for fruits, nuts, and other food items from trees and shrubs while also accessing ground-level resources like tubers, roots, and animal carcasses. This dietary flexibility may have been crucial for survival in environments that were becoming more open and less forested. Additionally, bipedalism may have been a key factor in the development of scavenging behavior, which is thought to have been an important part of early hominin diets. Scavenging for meat would have required hominins to cover large distances efficiently, 
as well as the ability to spot and reach carcasses before other predators or scavengers arrived. The evolution of bipedalism, by allowing hominins to move quickly across the landscape and freeing their hands for carrying meat or tools, would have made scavenging a more viable strategy. The consumption of meat, in turn, may have played a role in brain expansion by providing essential nutrients that supported cognitive development. In terms of reproductive success, bipedalism likely had significant implications for sexual selection and mate choice. Early hominins that were more efficient at walking or running may have been better able to provide food for themselves and their offspring, making them more attractive to potential mates. Additionally, the increased mobility provided by bipedalism would have allowed hominins to explore larger territories, increasing the likelihood of encountering potential mates from different groups, which could have promoted genetic diversity. It is also worth noting that the shift to bipedalism likely came with some trade-offs in terms of reproductive anatomy and childbirth. As the pelvis adapted for walking upright, it became narrower, which made childbirth more difficult. This challenge may have led to the evolution of earlier birth times in humans, resulting in more altricial, helpless, infants who required extended care and nurturing after birth. This prolonged period of infant dependency would have further reinforced social bonding and cooperative behaviors within hominin groups. Finally, the development of bipedalism may have had important implications for early hominin defense strategies. By standing upright, Hominins could better detect predators from a distance, giving them more time to react and escape. Bipedalism also freed the hands for wielding sticks, stones, or other tools that could be used in defense against predators or rival groups. The ability to walk upright while carrying a weapon or tool would have given early hominins a distinct advantage in defending themselves and their social group. In summary, the evolution of bipedalism was not just a physical transformation but a catalyst for a host of social changes. By freeing the hands, bipedalism opened the door to more complex behaviors, including tool use, cooperation, parental care, and early forms of communication. These social adaptations, in turn, played a crucial role in shaping the evolutionary trajectory of early hominins, laying the foundation for the development of more complex societies and, eventually, the emergence of modern humans. Part 8, Modern Bipedalism, The Legacy of an Evolutionary Journey The final chapter in the story of bipedalism brings us to Homo sapiens, our species, which evolved roughly 300,000 years ago. Modern humans are the culmination of millions of years of evolutionary adaptation, and bipedalism is one of the defining traits that sets us apart from other primates. Our ability to walk and run efficiently on two legs has enabled us to thrive in a wide variety of environments, spread across the globe, and develop complex civilizations. One of the most important features of modern human bipedalism is the S-shaped curve of the spine, which balances the weight of the upper body over the pelvis. This curvature is crucial for maintaining stability during walking and running, as it helps to absorb the shock of each step and prevent the body from tipping forward. The spine's curve, combined with the shape of the pelvis and the length of the legs, gives humans an efficient, upright posture that minimizes energy expenditure during locomotion. The evolution of the foot also reached its final form in modern humans, with a fully developed arch that acts as a spring, storing and releasing energy with each step. The alignment of the toes, particularly the non-opposable big toe, allows for a powerful push-off, which propels the body forward. The ankle joint is stable and strong, providing the support needed for both walking and running. These adaptations make modern humans exceptional long-distance walkers and runners, capable of covering great distances with relatively little fatigue. The efficiency of human bipedalism has been key to our ability to colonize diverse environments. From the deserts of Africa to the Arctic tundra, humans have used their bipedal mobility to explore new territories, gather resources, and build societies. Our ancestors, such as Homo erectus, were among the first to migrate out of Africa, and modern humans followed in their footsteps, eventually spreading to every corner of the earth. One of the most remarkable aspects of modern human bipedalism is our ability to run long distances. Unlike many other animals, 
Humans are persistence hunters, meaning we can chase prey over long distances until it is exhausted. This endurance running ability is thought to have played a crucial role in early human survival, particularly in the arid environments of Africa, where water and food sources were often spread out over vast distances. The endurance running hypothesis suggests that human bipedalism evolved not just for walking but also for running, allowing early humans to hunt and scavenge effectively. Features such as the stabilization of the head during running, the spring-like arches in the feet, and the cooling mechanisms of sweat glands all point to adaptations for endurance running. These traits, combined with our cognitive abilities and tool use, made early humans highly effective hunters, able to track and pursue prey over long distances. In modern times, bipedalism continues to shape our daily lives and activities. Walking and running remain central to human health and well-being, and our ability to stand upright has influenced the way we interact with the world around us. From building tools and technology to constructing cities and transportation systems, bipedalism has had a profound impact on human culture and development. However, the evolution of bipedalism has also come with its drawbacks. The human spine, while adapted for walking upright, is prone to issues such as lower back pain, herniated discs, and other musculoskeletal problems. These issues are thought to be a result of the evolutionary trade-offs involved in bipedalism. While our upright posture allows for efficient locomotion, it also places a great deal of stress on the spine, joints, and muscles, particularly in modern environments where sedentary lifestyles and poor posture can exacerbate these issues. Childbirth is another area where bipedalism has had significant consequences. The narrowing of the pelvis, which is necessary for efficient bipedalism, makes human childbirth more difficult compared to other primates. This evolutionary constraint, known as the obstetric dilemma, has led to the evolution of earlier births, resulting in more altricial infants who require extended care and nurturing. While this has contributed to the development of strong social bonds and cooperative care, it also makes childbirth more dangerous for human mothers. Despite these challenges, the advantages of bipedalism have far outweighed the drawbacks. Walking upright has allowed humans to explore new environments, develop advanced tool use, and build complex societies. The legacy of bipedalism is evident in every aspect of human life, from our ability to travel long distances to the structure of our social interactions. Today, as we look back on the evolutionary journey that led to modern human bipedalism, we can see how this seemingly simple adaptation shaped the course of human history. From our arboreal ancestors who first ventured onto the ground to the highly efficient bipedal locomotion of modern humans, the evolution of walking on two legs is a testament to the power of natural selection and adaptation. In conclusion, bipedalism is not just a mode of locomotion, it is a fundamental aspect of what it means to be human. It has influenced our anatomy, our behavior, our social structures, and our ability to survive and thrive in diverse environments. As we continue to evolve and adapt to new challenges, the legacy of bipedalism will remain a central part of our identity as a species. Part 9, Bipedalism and the Expansion of the Human Brain The link between bipedalism and the expansion of the human brain is one of the most intriguing aspects of human evolution. While bipedalism is largely seen as an adaptation for efficient locomotion, it also freed up crucial energy and resources that were redirected toward the growth of our ancestors' brains. This chapter explores how bipedalism played a role in the development of larger, more complex brains, setting the stage for advanced cognitive functions, social behaviors, and technological innovations. The earliest hominins to exhibit clear signs of bipedalism, such as Australopithecus afarensis and Ardipithecus ramidus, had relatively small brains. At this stage of evolution, the primary advantage of bipedalism was likely related to survival in an increasingly open environment. However, as hominins began to walk more efficiently in over longer distances, bipedalism laid the groundwork for a shift in energy distribution within the body, one that ultimately favored brain expansion. To understand how bipedalism influenced brain growth, we must first consider the concept of energy allocation. 
In all animals, there is a balance between the energy that is spent on basic survival activities, such as movement, digestion, and reproduction, and the energy that can be devoted to more specialized functions, such as brain development. In quadrupedal primates, a significant portion of energy is used for locomotion, particularly for moving through trees and supporting their bodies during climbing. In contrast, bipedalism, while initially less efficient than quadrupedalism, evolved to become a highly energy-efficient mode of travel, especially over long distances. As bipedalism became more refined in hominins like Homo erectus, it significantly reduced the energy cost of locomotion. Studies have shown that walking on two legs consumes less energy than knuckle-walking or quadrupedalism over long distances, allowing hominins to conserve energy for other purposes. This energy efficiency was a key factor in the survival and reproductive success of early human ancestors. With more energy available, natural selection favored the reallocation of some of these energy resources to the brain, which is one of the most metabolically expensive organs in the body. This increase in energy availability allowed for the gradual enlargement of the brain, a trend that began to accelerate around 2 million years ago with the appearance of Homo erectus. The brain size of Homo erectus was approximately twice that of Australopithecus and significantly larger than that of earlier hominins. This increase in brain size corresponds to a period of behavioral complexity, including the development of more advanced tools, longer migrations, and possibly even the emergence of early forms of social organization and communication. The expansion of the brain did not come without costs, however. The human brain requires a significant amount of energy to function, approximately 20% of the body's total energy expenditure in modern humans, despite only accounting for about 2% of body weight. As a result, early hominins needed to develop strategies to meet these growing energy demands. One of the most important adaptations was a shift in diet, which became richer in nutrient-dense foods like meat and animal fat. The ability to walk efficiently over long distances allowed early hominins to scavenge and hunt more effectively, further fueling brain growth with high-quality calories. Another key aspect of brain expansion in hominins is the evolution of social behaviors that are closely linked to the demands of living in complex groups. Larger brains allowed for greater cognitive abilities, including problem-solving, planning, and social interaction. As hominin groups grew in size and complexity, individuals needed to navigate social hierarchies, build alliances, and cooperate in ways that were far more advanced than in earlier primates. The expansion of the brain, made possible in part by the energy efficiency of bipedalism, allowed for the development of these cognitive skills, which were essential for survival in increasingly challenging environments. Tool use is another area where the evolution of bipedalism and brain expansion intersected. The earliest stone tools, associated with the Oldowan industry, date back to about 2.6 million years ago. These simple tools were likely used for scavenging and processing food, but their production required a certain level of cognitive ability, including planning and fine motor control. The development of more sophisticated tools over time, including the Acheulean hand axes used by Homo erectus, is closely tied to the increase in brain size. These tools were not only a reflection of greater intelligence but also enabled hominins to obtain more nutrient-rich foods, further fueling brain growth. Bipedalism also facilitated the evolution of other behaviors that are linked to brain expansion, such as the development of language and symbolic thought. While the exact timing of the emergence of language is still debated, many researchers believe that the evolution of complex communication was driven by the social and cognitive demands of living in larger groups. Bipedalism allowed early hominins to engage in face-to-face -face interactions more easily, which may have facilitated the development of gestural communication and eventually vocalizations. The social brain hypothesis posits that as group size increased, so too did the cognitive demands of maintaining social relationships. Hominins with larger brains were better able to navigate these social complexities, and as a result, they may have been more successful in terms of reproduction and survival. Over time, natural selection favored individuals with larger brains and more advanced cognitive abilities, leading to the continued expansion of the brain in later hominin species, including Homo sapiens. 
However, the relationship between bipedalism and brain expansion is not just a matter of energy allocation and social complexity. The very anatomy of bipedalism also had direct implications for brain growth, particularly in terms of childbirth. As hominins evolved to walk upright, their pelvises became narrower, which created a challenge for delivering babies with larger brains. This evolutionary constraint, known as the obstetric dilemma, led to a trade-off in human development. To accommodate both bipedalism and brain expansion, hominins began to give birth to more altricial, underdeveloped, infants, who required longer periods of care and nurturing after birth. This change in reproductive strategy had significant social implications, as it required greater investment from both parents and potentially from other members of the group. The extended period of infant dependency likely contributed to the development of cooperative childcare and other forms of social cooperation, which in turn may have driven further brain expansion. The need to care for helpless infants also placed additional demands on cognitive abilities, as hominins had to coordinate childcare, food acquisition, and protection from predators. In summary, the evolution of bipedalism was a critical factor in the expansion of the human brain. By reducing the energy costs of locomotion and freeing up energy for brain growth, bipedalism set the stage for the development of larger, more complex brains in early hominins. This brain expansion, in turn, enabled hominins to engage in more advanced social behaviors, tool use, and communication, all of which were essential for survival in increasingly challenging environments. While bipedalism and brain expansion are often studied as separate aspects of human evolution, they are deeply interconnected. The physical changes associated with walking on two legs had profound effects on the cognitive and social evolution of our ancestors, shaping the development of traits that are central to what it means to be human today. As we continue to explore the origins of bipedalism and its role in human evolution, it becomes clear that this adaptation was not just about moving from place to place, it was about reshaping the entire trajectory of our species' development. Part 10 the future of bipedalism in humans. As we look toward the future of human evolution, it is worth considering how bipedalism, a trait that has been so central to our species' development, might continue to shape us in the coming millennia. Advances in technology, changes in our environment, and shifts in human behavior all have the potential to influence the future trajectory of bipedalism. One of the most significant factors that could impact bipedalism in the future is the increasing use of technology and automation. In many modern societies, physical activity has decreased as machines take over tasks that once required human effort. This shift toward a more sedentary lifestyle has already had noticeable effects on human health, including increases in obesity, musculoskeletal disorders, and other conditions related to physical inactivity. If this trend continues, it is possible that the selective pressures that once favored efficient bipedalism may diminish, potentially leading to changes in human anatomy over time. Technological advancements, particularly in the field of robotics and prosthetics, also raise interesting questions about the future of bipedalism. As scientists and engineers develop more advanced forms of mobility assistance, such as exoskeletons and robotic limbs, the need for natural bipedal locomotion may decrease. In extreme cases, future humans could rely on artificial means of movement, which could alter the evolutionary pressures acting on the musculoskeletal system. However, it is important to note that such changes would likely take many thousands or even millions of years to manifest given the slow pace of evolutionary change. In addition to technological changes, the future of bipedalism may also be influenced by environmental factors. As climate change continues to reshape the planet, humans may need to adapt to new landscapes and conditions. Rising sea levels, desertification, and the loss of biodiversity could all create environments where different forms of locomotion might become advantageous. For example, in regions that become more waterlogged or prone to flooding, humans may need to develop new strategies for movement, whether through wading, swimming, or the use of aquatic vehicles. Another potential factor in the future of bipedalism is space exploration and colonization. If humans establish colonies on other planets or in space habitats, the reduced gravity in these environments could lead to changes in the human body. 
In low-gravity environments, the need for strong leg muscles and bones may diminish, potentially leading to the weakening of these structures over generations. Already, astronauts who spend extended periods in space experience muscle atrophy and bone loss due to the lack of gravity. If future humans live in such environments for long periods, bipedalism as we know it could become less relevant, and new forms of movement could emerge. Cultural and societal changes may also play a role in the future of bipedalism. As human populations become more urbanized and technology continues to advance, the environments in which we live are becoming increasingly artificial. In many cities, people spend the majority of their time indoors, walking on flat surfaces and using elevators, escalators, and vehicles to move between locations. This reduced need for walking and climbing in everyday life could lead to a gradual decline in the importance of bipedalism as a selective pressure in human evolution. Despite these potential changes, it is important to recognize that bipedalism remains one of the most fundamental aspects of human anatomy and behavior. Our ability to walk on two legs has shaped not only our physical form but also our cognitive and social evolution. Even in a future where technology and environmental changes alter the way we live, bipedalism is likely to remain a defining characteristic of our species for the foreseeable future. In conclusion, bipedalism is not just a trait that evolved millions of years ago, it is a dynamic aspect of human evolution that continues to influence our bodies, behaviors, and societies. As we look toward the future, it is clear that bipedalism will continue to play a central role in shaping the trajectory of human development, even as new challenges and opportunities arise. Whether through technological innovation, environmental adaptation, or the exploration of new frontiers, bipedalism will remain a key element of what it means to be human. Thanks for joining us on this journey through the evolution of bipedalism. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more deep dives into human history. Leave a comment below with your thoughts or questions, and we'll see